we've been talking about k-means clustering and just finished looking at the hard boundary version of the algorithm with the hard boundaries our class labels are one class or another class and there's no real sense of in betweenness and when we're updating the cluster means we take all of the samples that have been assigned to say cluster k and we compute an average location for our new cluster mean and when we do this the samples that are very near a cluster the cluster boundary have equal weight in this computation as those that say are nearer to the cluster mean or to those that are far away from any of the boundaries but still within the cluster k region and we'd like to be a little bit fuzzier about uh, how each of those points pulls on the cluster mean. It's also possible with the hard boundary approach for the learning algorithm to get stuck into a cycle where some points are very near the cluster boundary on one side, other points are very near the cluster boundary on the other side. And in one iteration, they're, they're in that configuration. And then the next iteration, they, they flip to the other side of the boundary and the algorithm can actually just continue to flip back and forth. So, we, so it never really settles out into a single solution. So the soft boundary approach tries to solve these uh, various problems. And what we do, uh, instead of assigning each sample to a particular cluster, we actually do this assignment in a probabilistic way. So the first thing we get out of this is we have probabilistic labels. So this feels a lot like, say, the logistic regression kinds of methods that we used to do classification. The other key difference is that when we go to estimate the cluster means, the different points get to uh, contribute to that new cluster mean estimate uh, as a function of what that probability is. So if we're really sure that a sample belongs to a cluster, it gets to pull on that sample mean a lot. If we're much closer to the boundary, then those points are going to play less of a role in re-estimating those cluster means. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the mathematics behind this. All right, the first thing we're going to do is define a new variable here, and I'm going to refer to this as PIK. So this is, we're going to interpret this variable as the probability that uh, sample i belongs to class k. And there are a variety of ways we can define this. I'm going to define it in one particular way. And, and that looks like this. So it's e to the minus uh, beta. And then we're going to look at the distance between our cluster center K and our sample I. And that is divided by a sum over all, over all clusters. And again, it's E to the minus beta M J minus X I. So by defining things in this way, this actually feels a lot like softmax. We've talked about the intuition behind that. One of the differences here is we've introduced this beta hyperparameter. We'll talk about that toward the end. And we're computing the score in a very specific way. And here the score is how different uh, the sample is from the cluster mean. By computing this P in this way, what uh, that implies if, is that if I take a sum over all of the p's for a given sample, then that is equal to one. And, and again, that's what we mean by probability, is that all of the probabilities have to sum to one. So just for illustration purposes, let's imagine that we have uh, a scenario where we have some set of cluster centers, and we'll do N3 over here and I have some sample xi. If we imagine 
to, so there, there's a particular distance between uh, each of the cluster centers and this sample Xi. We imagine taking, say, this M2 and moving it away. So the new M2 uh, comes out to be over here. The only thing that we've changed is the distance between M2 and, and Xi. And the distance between Xi and the remaining clusters hasn't changed. So the implication is that uh, when we move M2 further away, the way we're computing this P up here means that uh, P I2 is going to go down because the distance is getting bigger. And because we are dividing by the, the sum of these terms, and that means that all of the other k's, all of the other pi k's not equal to two, these are going to go up because again, that full sum has to be equal to one. So that's, so that's point one. The, the other point, let me illustrate with a, a slightly different situation. Imagine I have, say our M0, and we'll have the same constellation here of, of clusters. So the dividing line, the, the equidistant point is sitting somewhere around, around here. So the dividing line between M2 and M3 sits somewhere about in here. And the dividing line between M3 and M0 sits somewhere about in here. So if we imagine now some Xi uh, sitting out over here, it's much closer to, to M3 than any one of the other cluster centers. So its probability is quite high. It's close to one. If we imagine that moving that point uh, closer and closer to this boundary, that probability is going to be dropping and the probability, uh, especially for M2, is going to start to go up since we're getting closer to M2. Really aren't changing our distance to M0 or M1 all that much, so those probabilities are not going to change. Likewise, if we take this point and we start moving it in this direction, that probability again for M3 is going to drop, but the probability that's going to increase mostly is, is this probability for class zero. So the, the key point here is that as we get closer to the dividing lines, that those probabilities drop in favor for the probabilities of the classes that are on the other side of the dividing line. For points that are very far away from all of the other clusters, those probabilities are going to be assigned to something close to one, and that's not going to change as we move this point around uh, a little bit. All right, so that's the intuition behind the probabilities. So now let's talk about the other half of the learning algorithm, which is this step of uh, assigning new cluster centers. And it turns out that the, the algorithm looks very similar to what we had before. So our MK now is going to be assigned a weighted sum of the XIs. And in this case, the weights are not based on those Bs, they're based on the probabilities. So it's a sum over all samples, PIK times XI, and divided by the PIKs. Okay, so, so quite literally we've just re replace the B terms with the PIK terms here. And, and that's the uh, essence of the difference between the hard boundary approach and the soft boundary approach. So to sum up the key ideas here with the soft boundary k-means clustering approach is that samples that are near boundaries, not only do they have a probabilistic labeling, but they contribute to the cluster means. All right, so to, to sum up the soft boundary k-means idea. So first off, as a sample 
gets closer to a boundary between two different clusters, first off, it has an interesting uh, probability. Uh, it doesn't have a crisp assignment to one cluster or the other. And secondly, it's going to contribute to the update of the cluster means in a fuzzy way. In fact, it's going to contribute to both clusters on either side of that boundary. And, and in particular, as that point crosses the boundary by just moving a, a small amount across the boundary, its contribution to the cluster mean computation really doesn't change all that much. So the implication here is that the learning process is a lot more stable. We get away from this situation where the learning algorithm gets into a cycle where it's moving that dividing line uh, such that points are flipping back and forth uh, uh, from one side to, to the other and then back again. One of the consequences is that we've introduced a new hyperparameter, and this is the, that beta term that, that we were looking at. When beta is very small, what this means is that no matter where a sample is in the feature space, all of the classes get some interesting probability assigned to them. So you end up with a very smooth probability assignment. And then as that beta term gets larger and larger, we tend to concentrate that probability onto one or a very small number of classes. So sometimes you'll see in the documentation that beta is being referred to as a sharpness parameter. All right, so that's the, the, the essence of uh, the soft boundary idea. And now it's time to play with a, a little bit of code. We'll focus on the hard boundary case. That's what's available in scikit-learn but you do need to know that this uh, soft boundary approach is also sitting out there.